to BSA by Design, a podcast about transforming healthcare, educational, and research facilities through expert design and insight. I'm your host, Brian Moore, and thanks for joining us again. In this episode, Kevin Token shares his insights in leading and managing large projects. Let me introduce Kevin. He is a principal with BSA who served as chairman and CEO of the firm from 2015 until May of 2023. He helped start BSA St. Louis Studio in 2008 as senior director. Kevin graduated from Rose Holman Institute of Technology with a BS in electrical engineering and received his master's in business administration from Marshall University. Welcome to BSA by Design, Kevin. I'd like to jump right in because I think there's several really great ideas to cover when it comes to discussing, leading, and managing large projects. So my first question for you is, what are the key challenges that you've encountered when dealing with large projects? I think when we're faced with starting a large project, one of the things we need to understand early on is who are the stakeholders? Large projects tend to attract a lot of people who care about the outcomes. So understanding who they all are, how we are going to include them, and maybe most importantly, how decisions will be made is one key. There are many other key factors at the beginning of a project, but experience has really shown that the people are the most important factor. So knowing who has a stake, what's important to them, and how we're all going to work together to make decisions will make everything else go more smoothly. I like that. People are generally the most important factor in any project. Even though it may be right uh, a physical or a technical issue, people are, people are really at the heart of everything. So let's back up a moment to the beginning. How do you approach project planning and initiation for large-scale project? Well, it's important to start with understanding the project's goals around schedule. In many cases, the client already has an idea of when they want to open the doors and start seeing patients or teaching new students or performing research in the new space. And time is always money. So while the project needs to be the right solution to meet the project goals, it also needs to be done on a timely basis. So I like to take that end date and work backward to understand what tasks need to be done in order to meet that end date with plenty of time for the transition into the new space. And then go back through and see where we can shrink the schedule to give ourselves even more play. Once we understand the overall schedule, we can schedule planning and design meetings for months out and even know at a high level what the agenda of each and every meeting will be and who needs to be there to make the right decisions at the right time. Time is money. Very well said. With so much happening, as you mentioned, Kevin, you're working backward off of a schedule. I would imagine communication is paramount in these big, complex projects. So how do you ensure effective communication among team members and key stakeholders? Well, this is one of the most important aspects of a project, getting the right information to the right people at all times, while at the same time being careful not to overwhelm people with information that they don't necessarily need. So different methods are used for different purposes. Information about project needs is extracted from the end users and delivered to the project team, mostly in the form of meetings. But we can also use surveys and ask for review comments along the way. And then the project team delivers written minutes, colored plans, renderings, 3D walkthroughs back to the users so that they can see that they've been heard. The technology now makes it so much more effective for a user who doesn't naturally understand floor plans to experience a 3D model and completely understand what they're going to have in the actual space. Regular touch bases with key leaders to keep them updated on the progress and to get major decisions made. And then project information pages where anyone could go anytime and retrieve real-time information for themselves if they want to. So we push information out, we pull it in, and we have it accessible for people to view at any time throughout the life of the project. Inside the project team, it's a different matter, and it's a matter of ensuring that the right people are talking to each other and collaborating all the time. That's a little bit easier at BSA because all of the design disciplines we have internally, they're so used to working together and so that most of that communication happens just organically. But for very large projects, we'll, we'll typically also have a lot of team members outside of BSA. 
Meetings and communication methods within the design team have to use everyone's time efficiently and at the same time make sure that collaboration is happening between the right people at the right times. One of the best tools we use for this is the pool plan. Every week we can go through what parts of the design should be complete in the coming weeks, confirm that they are on track, and raise questions about how each component of design impacts some other component. Then collaboration around that can, off, can happen offline. So it's really about finding ways to make sure people are asking the right questions and getting together to find answers. You talk about this collaboration and with so many moving pieces and parts in a large project, I, I'm thinking of this as, you know, people are a resource. So what does resource allocation look like? Or maybe a better way to ask this, Kevin, is how do you allocate resources effectively or efficiently to meet project demands? One of the things I really like about BSA is our drive in recent years towards what we call one BSA. We have six studios across the country, and in a lot of companies, those geographic separations become silos. I've heard many times of two offices from the same company actually competing against each other for the same work. But at BSA, we've driven those barriers down. Our studios aren't individual profit centers, and our people are encouraged to work together no matter where a person is located. The benefit of that is that we're able to put the right people on a project, not only the local people or the person who's available. We can allocate the people who know the most about a project type at the right times during the project, no matter where it is located. It's taken some time, but we've obtained a level of efficiency inside the firm at sharing resources so that at this point it's become second nature. We were already working this way before COVID, but that period of time forced us to get really good at working together while in separate locations. So while a project will always have a local leadership, having the ability to utilize expertise that is spread all over the country is a real benefit to our clients, especially on large projects. Yeah, that's, that's our local leadership national expertise model. I think I'll put a plug in here to anyone listening. We covered local leadership and national expertise in episode three of this podcast, in case you missed it. I'd like to encourage you to listen to it for a little bit more in-depth look in it. Uh, okay, Kevin, let's switch gears and talk about scope changes. So scope changes are almost inevitable. How do you handle scope changes while also keeping the project on schedule and within budget? Scope changes are inevitable, especially on large projects. At our very large project for IU Health right now, they actually added a floor during design. So, And there are obviously much smaller scope changes that typically happen during a project. Sometimes the client or the end user who is asking us for the change doesn't even realize that it makes an impact on the cost or the schedule. So it's our job as the architect and the engineer to identify when we recognize a potential scope change and to document it for the client. They need to know that one, there's a change that will impact either the budget or the schedule or both. Two, what that impact will be. And finally, is there something that can change elsewhere in the design to offset that scope change? So constantly managing and communicating the information along with the cost and schedule data is so important. And it's really our responsibility along with the construction manager to make sure the client isn't surprised one day after six months of changes happening, they need to be constantly kept updated and given the information they need to make good decisions all along the way. I'm hearing communicate, communicate, communicate. <laughs> Large projects no doubt come with risk and therefore risk management must be vital, I'm assuming. So how do you identify, assess, and mitigate risks effectively? I think it's important to try and anticipate the risks at the very beginning of a large project. I'll give you one example. At Memorial Health in Springfield, Illinois, we did the planning and then the full service design for a large project. It was a portion of which included a vertical expansion for new patient rooms. So we were stacking new rooms on top of existing space. And as luck would have it, that existing floor right below was one of the sickest group of patients in the entire complex, and that's the cancer unit. So we knew we were going to have a major risk of noise intrusion, workers in the space, and even interruption of service at times during construction. 
So we identified that during the planning stage so that we could work closely with the staff in that unit and the construction manager to develop acceptable practices and schedules to get the work done that needed to happen on that floor. Communication with, with the staff was key because they knew what to expect and it happened just like we said it would. And in the end, it was of course a short-term difficulty for them, but they were happy with the process because we met the expectations we set very early on. These complex projects often involve multiple stakeholders and you just mentioned meeting expectations that you set early on. But how do you manage a wide range of what I'm assuming are diverse stakeholder expectations to ensure project success? Oftentimes, we have to play almost a psychologist role in our projects. Stakeholders can have different goals and objectives, and in some cases, they've been sent to represent a group of people who expect their needs to be met. So I'd say a couple of things about successfully managing through what can be a minefield. It sounds simple, but there has to be a lot of listening and pulling those needs out in the open so that everyone can understand the goals of everyone else. This part is messy, but it gets all of the information out there. And then once you have all that in one place, the group has to commit to identifying the true priorities of the group as a whole, not just the individual special interests of one person or another. Together, they need to identify and agree to the highest priorities so that the project goals and the objectives can be identified clearly. Sometimes we refer to this as visioning. You've probably heard that term before. Once that is done, it becomes a bit easier because we put those goals and objectives in front of everyone constantly. At the beginning of every meeting, we go over them again. On the project information site, they are prominently shown. When ideas or questions come up, we go back to those goals and objectives to make sure decisions we're making as a group align with that vision of the project. You're quite experienced at managing large projects, Kevin, which is one of the main reasons, as you know, I thought you'd be great to talk to about this topic. I'm curious what role technology plays in managing large projects, and I'm guessing that's changed over the years, and now we've got AI coming along so quickly So my last question for you is, how do you leverage technology and project management tools? It's cliche, but this is changing constantly. The tools we have at our disposal are becoming more and more powerful with the advent of AI and the applications to our industry. We have people who are identified as the first adopters within our firm, and they may work with a new software for a time to see how well it works identify the pros and the cons and whether it's worth the cost. Because every time we introduce a new tool, it's not only the cost of the software or the licenses, but the cost of training the people. And there's always a period of time where people are actually less efficient than they were before while they learn the new product and go through the change curve. And that's costly to us and potentially to the client. So we are careful about what we introduce and when. But there are some exciting things happening. The tools we use, for example, for building energy modeling and life cycle cost analysis and for computational fluid dynamics, for example, are very exciting. The newer tools are easier to use and much more powerful than anything we've had before. And now we can give a machine a design problem, a program of space and some other guideposts, and it can produce several ideas for a floor plan that might work as the solution. Of course, as the professionals, we still need to take the time to review those for the positives and the negatives, and our solution might not be any of the ideas that popped out the other side, but those ideas can at least be helpful in uh, coming to the right solution. And the advantage of that is that, so now where architects and engineers used to spend most of their time with design, drafting and detailing, they're more engaged in building performance, visualization, research data analysis, and processes. So because the tools can do more of the mundane work, the the professionals in our industry can focus on making the solutions great for the client. Really insightful overview on leading and managing large projects. Thanks to Kevin for joining us on this episode. If you're interested in learning more about how Kevin and many others on our team can lead your next large project, please reach out and connect with us. And we also encourage you to visit our website at bsalifestructures.com. There's a link in the show notes to contact us for more information. 
Be sure to subscribe to BSA by Design wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss an episode. And we've got more content and stories to share through various platforms. So be sure to follow us on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and X. That's going to do it for this episode. Join us again next time on BSA by Design. Thank you.